Hi everyone, another requested video about Betty Cooper in Riverdale. This video is going to be a three part journey, it's going to be divided sort of in three parts. Since Betty Cooper is not an original character but she was repurposed from uh, a popular comic, the first part will showcase the differences and similarities of the Betty Cooper character as a way to identify her good girl next door nature. In the second part we will see how her femininity is framed as opposed to uh, Veronica. In the final part of the video we'll focus more on Betty as as a modern character and what exactly does the darkness represent. Since Archie Comics has been around more than 70 years, Betty and Veronica do act as an historical reference point in relation to the contemporary social values in regards to women. For example, in 1947, a comic depicts how a teacher in Riverdale, Miss Grundy, is upset over the fact that no one wants to take her domestic science curse because the girls prefer the new athletic program. Cut to a cut fight in the locker room and the last panel showcases how the girls change their mind with Betty delivering a punchline regarding how women's place is in the home. This is a comic from 70 years ago and we can see how at the time the lesson to be learned was to avoid uh, straying from gender expectations and how the comic reinforced the domestic ideal. One of the points of Two Days Riverdale, according to its writers, is that of satirizing the typical aspects of the original Archie comics and break the stereotypes that were enforced on its characters. Betty, therefore, should remain an all-American girl on the surface, but should also possess an additional depth in order to subvert the typical girl-next-door trope, which is so typical of Betty's nature. However, in the Archie comics, Betty is also, both aesthetically than personality-wise, a chic tomboy, something which in Riverdale has been negatively reversed as hyper-feminine, something which is reflected in her handless choice of pastel soft good girls clothes. In Archie comics, Betty could do everything from changing a tire to playing baseball, something that not only doesn't exist in Riverdale, but it is used as a way to reinforce her femininity. In Riverdale, the only sport she plays is cheerleading, which is portrayed more as a groupie activity rather than an actual sport. Although we do see a scene in season two in which she helps with Jagger's car, her personality and aesthetics is much less prone as stereotypically male in Davis as it was in the Archie comics. This is to say that I'm not sure that Betty as well as all the other archetypes of the hot new girl and widow for example that Riverdale supposedly meant to subvert are that different from what the comics portrayed 70 years ago. Sure, now we won't get lines like a place woman is in the home, especially because they wouldn't be well received in 2018, but a series of choices in Riverdale do not exactly help in disrupting certain notions either. After all, 10 years ago, magazines asked whether you were a Betty or a Veronica, and today we have websites pretty much doing the same thing. As Mallory Andrews has noted, what we talk about when we talk about Riverdale has less to do with exalting it as a commentary of our times than it does with giggling over our teen crushes or determining which of our friends is the jughead. One of the best aspects which I recognize to Riverdale Riverdale is the choice of uniting its female characters, Betty and Veronica, rather than putting them in a constant competition. At their very core, Betty and Veronica served Archie Comics as opposites fighting over a boy. The opposition here being the stereotypical tendency of categorizing women in terms of two polar opposites, originated from medieval church dogma referred to as Eve Mary complex and further evolved in contemporary popular culture as the Madonna whore dichotomy. The former being Betty, the virtuous of the pair, and the second being Veronica, the attractive but somehow evil counterpart. Riverdale has almost immediately shown its stance on this, making Betty and Veronica more than just frenemies. The show, however, does still portray this dichotomy in more subtle ways. For example, in the season 2 premiere, while Betty cautiously tells us that she almost had sex with Jughead, 
Veronica is shown seducing Archie in the shower. Whenever a strain is placed on Betty and Veronica's friendship, it has almost always to do with its clashing characteristics. Veronica's got you wrapped around her little finger. And other parts of her body. Here we go. Saint Betty and Succubus So just for clarity. One pure and meek, the other egotistical and vain. <laughs> what was that, Betty? I mean, think about it. Spoiled rich girl. Check. Major daddy issues. Check. Bad to the bone. Trying to control everyone around her, including her boyfriend and best friend. Check, check, check. And although Riverdale shows us Betty making mistakes or being arrogant at times, her negative actions are either excused on the dark Betty persona, something which, by the way, reminds me a lot of Dex's excuse of a dark passenger that absolves him of the murders he commits, are never called out directly or are called out but by a villain of the show. And I'm telling you to help FP or... Or what? Or I wide release the video of your father shooting Jason. Try having closure with that out in the world. Betty, therefore, does experience a lot of suffering, but it's often unrelated to her actions. Riverdale tells us that she doesn't need to face consequences for her negative behavior because at the end of the day, Betty still remains the good girl next door, which ultimately means well. Interestingly, it's one of Archie Comics' main cartoonist, Don De Carlo, which in a 1978 strip engages and disrupts this dichotomy. In the split personality story, De Carlo shows us how Betty and Veronica shouldn't represent the choice between one or the other but rather they are two halves of the same girl. Because this idolized conflicting lens which popular culture has taught us to see women as, are you a Betty or a Veronica, a Jackie or a Marilyn, is fundamentally impossible to achieve. Because real women are not a one-dimensional exaggerated version of a character in a comic, but rather complex individuals with different personality traits. So, by now we have identified how Betty exemplifies the good girl next door trope. She embodies the wholesome sort of femininity, rarely promiscuous, lovable girl. However, in season 3, we start seeing through the cracks and Dark Betty is presented to us. This initial representation hinted at a possible multiple personality disorder, because Betty isn't just portraying a character, she has become someone else and later she has no recollection of what she has done. How far were you going to take it? Chuck deserved it. You called him Jason. No, I, I didn't do that. Yeah, girl. You did. You called yourself Polly. It was like Dr. Jekyll, Mistress Hyde. You became another person. Then clearly the writers decided to go a different way for Dark Betty's persona. Suddenly she knows when she's dark, she remembers it, and she suffers from it. More often than not, however, this old storyline is not clear. The writers do fuck up several times. They go back and forth to... Uh, mental illness, self-harm, identity crisis, repressed sexuality. So something which is potentially very interesting to watch, especially on a CW teen TV show, is somehow sometimes turned into a simplistic way to give Betty an edge. Giving girls a dark side in teen TV shows has become a sort of a trope. All of the sudden, they strip, they have dark underwear, if blonde, dark hair colors, and they change overnight. So this potential very interesting view on Betty's mindset, the pressure and anguish which she feels in certain episodes is not explored as much as it is fetishized. Do I look good? Mm-hmm. Can I address for you? Yeah. When it works well though, this dark Betty clearly derives from Betty's inability to deal with the pressure of looking and being perfect. They're acting like the last week and the last few months didn't even happen. Polly's back home, my dad's back home, my mom's back at the register. They all just keep smiling and talking about the Jubilee. Just like Nina Soyes, the ballerina in Black Swan portrayed by Natalie Portman, Betty has a controlling mother, a pink bedroom that indicates a suspended childhood, and an obsession with perfection. Here, pink perfection, it's more you. 
the stress of making her life appear manageable manifests in self-harm. Unaware of other coping mechanisms, Betty digs into her own wrists. Her repression leads to unhealthy expressions of what she feels. What lies beneath her facade, her perfection facade, starts falling apart in season two, when her identity is placed under scrutiny by the Black Hood. When you said Nick's name in that moment of nakedness, you let me see the real Betty. And she was beautiful and righteous. Judge, jury, executioner. No, no, that's not, I'm... That's... Now that I've seen your true self, Betty, the real work can begin. This is literally portrayed by Riverdale in her appearance. Her once uptight ponytail leaves the place to a loser one, a symbolic aesthetic of Betty's darker existential crisis arc during those episodes. And that's also why Betty and Jagged work so well as a couple. Despite initial appearances which would place them as direct opposites, they are both dealing with a sense of alienation. But whereas Betty tries to hide her own under a good girl next door persona, Jagged wears it like an armor to keep everyone at a safe distance. It is exactly through the episodes focusing on Betty and Black Hood where we start seeing the reality of Betty. She is a character that plays with duality. After all, she didn't need a costume to tell Cheryl to get the fuck out of her house in season one. Get out of my house. Not until Cheryl, you're telling get me the hell out of my house before I kill you. This is what I think is the crucial point, the key critical element in her character arc, and that I really hope Riverdale will explore more going forward. Jagged sees this in Betty when he tells us that she is a Hitchcock blonde. A Hitchcock blonde is the type of tall, perfect looking blonde woman that Alfred Hitchcock used as its leading character. Hitchcock loved to mess with these women both on screen and off screen, in a way to dirty up their purity, something which is clearly used as an inspiration for the Black Hood obsession with Betty. What will make you stop? You, as long as you continue showing me your devotion. I can't keep doing this. Sure you can. The Hitchcock blonde, however, reveals herself as more than the mere idealized version that it's meant to be at the beginning. These characters turn out mysterious, unexpectedly passionate, and therefore intrinsically duplicious. I'm breathing down your neck. Can you feel it? Can you feel me? As Jeff Saporito writes for Screen Prism, the Hitchcock blonde represents a restructuring of the submissive domestic female popular image of the time. While she fits the physical appearance of the classic model, she operates as a modern woman with a simmering sexuality and emotional complexity hidden beneath a clean wardrobe, aloof perfection and hairspray. So while Black Hood tries to submit Betty through his deceitfulness, she turns out to be far less innocent than she's supposed to be. It is exactly her duplicity which Betty fails to reconcile with, but rather than hide it, she should learn to embrace it. Only then Riverdale can work with Betty's unexpected depth and ultimately subvert the good girl next trope that she represents.